Um, well, welcome everybody to the Social Call for Back Conference here at Gilwell. Um, I'm just going to give you a bit of a welcome and a little bit of housekeeping, that health and safety thing that we all have to do. Um, so sorry about that, but bear with me. Um, my name is Keith Fee French. I've sort of been the sleeping partner of the book that prompted this uh, conference to happen. Neil and Andy um, have done some other workshops, but uh, I haven't been along with them, so I've been thrown in the deep end now, so you're going to see quite a bit of me through the day. I'm sorry about that, but it's just part of being here. You know. So, um, as I say, well, just to let you know as well that questions will be taken after most of the presentations. I'm sure with all these great minds sitting in front of me, there will be questions. Um, obviously, we're going to have to be quite strict on time, otherwise we'll end up running over, etc, etc. So, I shall be prompting the uh, presenters from hiding behind there. Um, probably have a big shepherd's group to pull them off in the end if they will not be quiet. And uh, I think one of the main reasons I've been given this job, because Neil, I think a lot of you know Neil, if Neil was up here doing the uh, announcements, etc., we'd never get a presentation done, he'd never stop talking. <laughs> so uh, that's why Neil's been put at the back as a facilitator. He'll be one of the roving lights. Um, if during the day you have any problems, there are several people here who can help you. Uh, we've got Aaron in the corner, anything IT, etc. We have Elaine, if you'd just like to stand up there, that's it. And we have Neil at the back, and Andy somewhere. We've lost him already, that's it. He's obviously off running an errand somewhere, as Andy is always doing. So, without any further ado, I'm going to hand you over um, to Ian Davidson Watts. Ian's job is to warm up the crowd and stir you up and get you going for the day. So, Ian, if you'd like to come up to the stage and do the first presentation. Let me just check the, uh, the sound system. Yeah, it's all good. Great. Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, it's great to see so many familiar faces and some new faces as well. Yeah, as um, as, as as explained, mm -hmm. I, you know, I was asked by Neil to do something at, the, at this uh, conference today, and uh, I said, well, what, "What do you want me to do?" And he just said, "Well, just get them thinking." Um, because look, you know, I'm 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 blessed to be sort of talking alongside some of the, the greats of, of those people who've been studying social calls for quite some time. And I guess my, my involvement has been I've been using social calls in, in one way or another for quite some time. Um, but I certainly can't put my hand up and say, you know, I'm leading this, this particular element of social So really I think that the title of my talk probably sums up perhaps where I'm coming from. And, and it's more of an aperitif, I suppose, than the rest of the day. I'm touching on a bit of everything else that other people are talking about. But I'm going to leave you hopefully just thinking about what, what might come uh, a bit later, sort of whet the appetite. Um, so, <coughs> Dr. Doom, <laughs> if we could talk to the animals, wouldn't that make life so much easier? Um, you know, do you need this type of roost? Is that hedgerow any good for you? No, 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 we'd prefer the farmers to do something more than rather us spend millions of pounds on infrastructure projects where they're not really achieving too much, but actually farmers and foresters are doing far more and blah, blah, blah. That's my, my personal thoughts on it. Um, but how can social calls help us with that process of impact assessment is where I'm coming from. Um, how can they help with ecological assessments? And you know, how can we use them? So what methods of use, you know, can we use social calls? Whether we're interpreting social calls, perhaps the bats are telling us something about their behaviour or their roost, or we're actually using social calls, you know, and, and we'll talk a bit more about lures a bit later on and, and how what advantages that might be for impact assessments. But there are issues and there are limitations. And again, I think this is a very embryonic stage in, in the back world of, of developing and looking at social calls. Social calls have been studied, you know, ever since I started doing bad stuff in the early 90s, but not as perhaps cohesively as um, echolocation calls broadly, you know, sort of navigational hunting calls. And I'm just going to probably give you a few little examples of some of those issues as we go through. So that's really what I'm talking about. Um, and then I might throw a few sort of slides up to talk about the future and perhaps what the future might look like as far as any crystal ball gazing goes. Um, so what do we do at the moment? Because if I was an alien that came down to planet Earth and read a consultant's report, that's all bats do. 
risk new forest of feet. And, and if you look at a lot of the guidelines, that's what we're really asked to do. So in, in many respects, you know, that's that's something I think we can perhaps get better at is working out what bats are doing. And I think I'm I'm, I'm coming from as a, a someone who promotes the use of advanced techniques like trapping and tracking and that sort of thing to get better quality data. I just pressed a button on a report this morning where we've got 44,000 back calls and 75% of those will be pinch traps. And I'm just trying to think, well, well you know, let, we just, let, we'll just focus on 25% of all that work. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's something we've been getting a lot of data, but sometimes I would argue that the quality is not necessarily there. We might have, and then probably 10% of the remainder will be myotis back. So we're not any closer to knowing which species it is. So, um, I've always been, I guess, jealous of those who can work out all the different myotis bats from application calls, but I certainly can't. And I certainly wouldn't put it in a report that I could. Um, and so we've got various bits of guidelines, and understanding how social calls can help perhaps characterise a roost. No doubt, plenty of people in this room have got low impact. You know, uh, licenses from Natural England. So for those who don't know what that is, it's, it's a license that's issued to experienced consultants who've got a fair bit of experience of dealing with, with bats, and they're allowed to deal with certain species, the more common species, <coughs> and certain types of roosts. If you do your survey in May and June, and perhaps July, you might have one single male bat using a uh, stroll using a roof space or a thing. You put that down as a day roost. You do the same survey in September, and it's on flighting all night for two weeks. Suddenly it's a mating roost. Well, the low impact license doesn't count <laughs> for a mating roost, but it does for the day roost. Does it really matter at the end of the day? Would the mitigation change? Probably not. But it does you know, have an influence. Social calls can have an influence in relation to that. So using social calls does have implications for survey methods. Are we going to be forced perhaps then to do the surveys ensuring we get ultimate, always, as a matter of course? I mean, my preference in an ideal world, we're going to have a minimum of three surveys, is to do one pre birth, post birth, and then one in autumn. As an absolute minimum, because you cover at least the main active period. But I've seen plenty of reports where three surveys are done in one month. So, what does that tell you? So, you know, I, I, and don't get me wrong, there are pressures on the, the industry to get reports done, and in some cases, you're lucky to get a back survey done at all. So, you know, it's not, it's not an ideal world. So, I'm just again trying to get people and that's what we sort of bring us down to is about how we do better ecological evaluations and impact assessments because that obviously has an ongoing effect for mitigation and with a low impact license you don't need to mitigate there's no requirement to compensate the loss of that roost and certainly not monitor it so if it is a mating roost you know that might be quite important for that, that local population of industry so what are we doing at the moment in the social calls? So at the moment we've got kind of the first methods. We, we do a lot of listening. We use loggers and we use handheld bat detectors and, and we wander around fields or we, we put them in um, we put them in buildings and that sort of thing. But do we always? I mean, is that a natural method for people in terms of leaving loggers out of buildings? Um, social calls can help us with a number of areas. Species identification. I'll go back to our myotis friends. Sorry about that hand. It was, it was, yeah, it was the first out. I was a bit excited with the first out I've got. <laughs> Nothing new there. Um, but um, at the moment, we're struggling to get information on the species, and, and, and as a result, you know, we're missing out on quality information to inform better impact assessments. And I do a lot of trapping, and you know, I get surprised every time I go out in the field that there's something new. Particularly in southern England, where I operate a lot, you know, Bech times uh, are becoming more prevalent because the right techniques are being used. And again, with, with the next slide, roost location nocturnals, I find more nocturnal roosts walking around the wood at dusk than I do staring at trees. And again, being slightly controversial, we're very good in this industry at one size fits all. You, know, you wouldn't apply the same survey technique for a dormouse and a red squirrel or a water bottle. But when it comes to nocturnals, Bechsteins, and Greater Horseshoe bats, bingo. Sorry guys, they're completely different in what they do and how they operate. But we apply the same techniques for them. So again, perhaps social calls can help us a bit, but you might have one method for one species and a different method for another. Roost characterization, I've already um, talked about that. Maggie's going to talk about you know, social calls within horseshoe roosts later on. 
And um, you know, perhaps there's ways of not catching bats, but working out its maternity risk, not just by numbers alone. And the picture on the left is actually Paul Benton's bat that was found in Staffordshire, um, which we tagged to a tree, a birch tree. Mind you, it was next to a, a big oak tree, lots of holes in it, it was using this birch tree. And there were 24 bats in there. It was a male. I thought, oh, he's hijacked a, a maternity roost. Didn't quite believe it. I always like to confirm any assessment. Next night, caught six of the bats coming out at intervals, all males. So it was actually a large male dorbentum's roost in a birch tree. So, again, but perhaps, because these were making lots of noises before they came out, perhaps those social calls could have told me something about that roost before I had to catch them. So again, as much as I promote that, because there doesn't seem to be a better way of doing it, getting better information, perhaps there's a way of reducing disturbance by using social calls more. And here's a particular unremarkable <laughs> outbuilding um, in Hampshire. It's a large sort of Nissan hut warehouse there. And uh, internal survey revealed lots of feeding remains, probably from the back, but not any droppings, if any at all, from, from, from memory. And uh, we put a logger in there. Um, and, you know, we've got logging calls. Great. We also got about 2,000 of these. <laughs> another consultancy firm has done another survey since, and don't get me wrong, I'm not bashing anyone else. <coughs> we only did that in September because we were instructed late. <laughs> okay. So that's the first thing I'll say. Another firm has done one in June, July, and August, and they just confirmed it's a So timing, well, look, they, they followed the guidelines, it wasn't a bad survey. But timing is everything. So there are implications and limitations to use of social calls from acoustic. And I mean I put that up because the, the book that these guys have produced is one of the first, you know, major references to actually refer back to and say, oh that's this or that's that, which is great. But we need more of it. We need more reference calls. And we need more research into social calls generally and what they mean. And hopefully from that we can then have some <coughs> evolution of guidelines. Which will probably have implications for things like survey design, like timings. And of course, I'm sure everybody's used auto ID, or if they haven't, it, it, don't get me wrong, it's, it's a tool that has lots of limitations. And one of them I found is um, pipistrelles and social calls equals barber stones. <laughs> okay, so. You know, auto ID struggling to have to deal with um, a, a social cause at the moment. And again, that's because what's behind it, you know, everything's based on hand release bats, or bats come out of roosts. You need to have a real life situation for a bat flying or commuting somewhere for it to be totally reliable. So there are a number of issues around that. The second area, um, I've got probably a bit more experience in this, is, is using is using lures. Um, now, I'm a, I've, I've used Sussex auto bats in some Abyss system for the last sort of, 15 years or so. And, um, but there are other lures available, um, which I've quite yet to trial, but most of my experiences have been based on the autobat. And, and one of the best things about the autobat is it, it, it increases capture rate. So if you're on a commercial job in particular, or on a research job, um, I mean, I did lots of trapping in the mid-90s in Woodlands and would sit night after night and not catch anything. And then it's rare I don't catch it back now with, with, with lures. And that's certainly the experience of other colleagues um, that I've been working with around the country as well. Um, and particularly for, for, for bats in clutter, we, you know, we found it quite useful. Um, so that's helpful. And just a good example of a project this year we've been working on for Eastern Borough Council. We, we, we did uh, 28 surveys of woodlands across their borough as part of a local development plan. And we, 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 um, we, we put out a bat logger along with each you know, sort of trapping area that we were in. So it's the same sort of habitat. And it was out for exactly the same time. I haven't done lots of fancy stats and all that kind of stuff. There's some size so probably small, which is an indication. But you can see, you know, that's dominated by, by common pits, and then you've got big pits, and then the others were a mixture of sort of big bats and then possibly the odd longing or whatever. But you can see the trapping results are very different, and it's a much better breakdown of, of the species. It's a much better sort of uh, proportion of, you know, 25% of the matter, <coughs> uh, which, which rarely get picked up well on acoustic surveys. Um, Targeting specific species, you know, the lure can be used for that. You're going to hear some great stuff on the next talk from, from David Hill and later on from Dan about the Methuselah project. But my own experience has really been with these two, and certainly for Bechsteins um, and Barbara Stella. But I had a very successful project in the mid 2000s, the Isle of Wight Bat project, and it was literally me in the net. 
I went around 42 Woodlands over two years. I caught 300 bats. Um, and 32% of those were Bechsteins. So A, the old white's an amazing place for Bechstein's bats. But B, that technique was really useful for them. From that, you know, this has changed how planning control and everything on the old white is, is, is effective because we've got 10 populated breeding populations of Bechsteins and, and six just in a two year period. And I, I was me doing it kind of part time, you know, in my own spare time, I believe. And a few roosts to boot. So, um, but there are issues and limitations because um, lures do um, affect that behaviour. There's, there's no doubt about that. And unfortunately, lures, we, we don't know what we're saying to bats. So we're talking to them, but it kind of reminds me of that close encounter of the third kind. You know, do, 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 do. We're about to destroy the planet, you know, and you're talking to us. And, and you can see, I'm at a spawning site in the late 90s here, and you'll see I'm holding a bat and doing some processing. This is pre rabies I might add. Um, and can you see that bat just persistently coming up to the bat I'm holding? I think I'm saying, but you are getting this, aren't you? <laughs> and it just persistently comes back and comes back, and when I release the bat, um, it's still in the air and it shoots after it. There it is. And so from a very sort of early time, you can see, you know, this, this um, that, that we are talking to the animals. <laughs> we just don't know what we're saying. So there are questions around: do do they deter? Do they disturb that? Again, from my experience, I would say it's been more of an advantage than a disadvantage. But we might be getting certain bats over and above others. Um, and most of the work we're doing with lures is pretty random. There's no real systematic studies and that sort of thing um, you know, to actually help us understand the effect of that lure. And just to give you another bit of a flavour for um, how these lures work, this is one call. Um, I paused it. And there's a little pip floating around the lure there. So there's a mist net just there. And um, so that's the pipistrel. Same call, it's a Bechstein's call. Okay. Then we have the myotas coming in. Oh, I just didn't quite get caught. Very frustrating sat there watching. And that whizzes about a bit more. Um, and then uh, a, a, probably about half an hour or so later, we get something piling from the left. And this is one of Steph's, I think. It's a uh, it's a long ear bat that whizzes in and flies around. Oh, Steph's, Steph, Steph's subject matter. And then finally, we have two bats chasing each other, coming round, and then bingo, they get caught. Okay. So you can also see that more bats approach the lure and get caught. And I mean, the experience of heart traps, of bats often fly through. So again, you're not getting a, a, an exact, you know, but it's still better than a lot of the situations. But when I went up to have a look at these two bats, that one was a whisker. That one's a little bit. Okay, so so much to learn that there's all this inter interspecies stuff going on as well. So we have Bechstein's call pulling in a range of different bats, and it gets nocturnals, it gets all sorts of other things that David will probably cover next. I'm not still in all this thunder. Okay. But you know, it, it surprises me every time. Um, every time you catch something, you get something new learn. And, and I think we're really at the very early, early stages here. And it's not just that. <laughs> um, I've, I've caught or seen three or four hours this year. I've had an hour sat on top of the, the speaker box. Um, I've been in Lincolnshire for a job I did last year. And uh, there was a tawny owl sat on a post just looking at the net. And I was approaching it. And it freaked me out because you just see this outline in the shadow. And, um, and then, yeah, I caught this thing for the birds out. It's a short, short hill. It's short now. So, what's the future then? Well, I'm really interested in, in getting the industry much better at getting quality data, not just quantity. And the, the quantity at the moment, I think, is driving everybody nuts when they're just sat there processing pit, 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 cricket, cricket, pit, 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 pit. You know, and you know, I think that, that, that that's got to change. I, I can't. I, I don't think it's a good. It's, good, it's not good value either, um, and, and it has limited information associated with it. And I think you know, there's there's a real role for, for social calls to be used for, for, for roosts as well. Roost characterisation. I think we can do a lot more with loggers in roost spaces. I mean, seeing a few long ears coming out of a big roof is really difficult. 
Most of the time it's after dark, you can't see anymore. And, and they're often coming out of the ridge that's just out of here anyway. So, you know, unless you're going to pick groups, it's, you're often missing stuff. Perhaps <coughs> leaving an auger in there for a week, you get a much better idea of how bats are using that roof. So, <coughs> sometimes droppings aren't from day risking bats, they might be bats that are visiting. But at the end of the day, we need more research. And I guess that's always a, a problem. And the last thing I'll leave you with is um, I've done a lot of swarming work in the late 90s. I still do it now. And um, I sit outside these caves with hundreds of bats, various different species, flying around. And they're not making any social calls. And I really do feel that perhaps a lot of social calls conference, but uh, it's hard to get me thinking here. <laughs> That communication confidence is more appropriate because I think social calls are just part of flight behavior, the way they use echolocation is part of that flight. Like we use body language. It's not just about what I'm saying, is it? It's about a whole raft of things that you're receiving information from me. <laughs> I'm getting more information back from you. <laughs> <laughs> it's about how bats fly and, and, and use their flying behavior as much as social calls. So, um, and I can certainly tell. What this bat's telling me at the moment, <laughs> after I released it, <laughs> he wasn't too happy. Okay. Any questions? Okay, thank you very much, Chris, and uh, to Ian for the introduction. Um, yeah, I'm going to be talking about the Sussex Autobat, and I've been working with the Autobat for uh, about 15 years now, so obviously you've got a lot of information about it, and it's very <coughs> difficult to be selective and choose a few things to tell you about and hopefully I will be able to keep the time and won't suffer from Keith's shepherd's crook. Um, basically, the uh, development of the autobat was related to this habitat, woodland, which is the most important of all habitats for bats. All of our bat species in this country use trees um, to some extent for roosting, foraging, commuting, or all three, and many of our most endangered species are woodland specialists. So this is the important habitat, and this is a really important place to find out what bats are there and how they're using it. But the paradox is that it's also a very difficult habitat to survey bats in, um, because they're hard to observe. Bats are always hard to observe, nocturnal, small, fast-moving, but particularly in this cluttered habitat where it gets darker um, earlier than it does in the open. And really, vision is not much use at all. Even with uh, night vision equipment, there's a limit to what you can do inside woodlands. Bats are also hard to detect in woodlands because they tend to give quiet calls. And also because, as Ian alluded to, um, many bat species calls are very difficult or impossible to distinguish from one another. I agree with him about my ages. I certainly believe you cannot survey peck signs, for example, using acoustic methods. And finally, bats in woodlands are hard to catch. What people usually do is put a net or a trap on a flyway, such as a track or a stream, and that way, yes, you can catch bats, but the bats you catch are the ones that frequently use those flyways. And species such as peck signs, to a lesser extent brown long ears, don't use flyways anything like as much as pipistrelles and uh, whiskered bats. That raises the question of why catch bats at all, and I'd like to just spend a few minutes talking, a few seconds talking about this. Um, capture provides information that um, can't be obtained from other methods. So, for example, you, with a bat in the hand, you can verify the species. Now, although there have been great advances in acoustic methods and identification, there are still large question marks, and to be absolutely certain that the species are to sight, you need to, uh, particularly the, the woodland bats, you need to catch them and verify in the hand. It's also the only way you can get definite information about the sex and reproductive status, and whether you've got a breeding female barbastel in a wood, and whether you've got a male passing through that wood, is really very important to know in terms of the importance of that wood. It could be the home to a maternity colony, or it could just be a uh, commuting route of one individual. Um, so it's important information. You can also get information on age, and condition, and so on. And it's also necessary for any work that involves these things, radio tracking, marking individuals to look at longevity or recapture rates, collecting samples of um, feces or hair or skin for DNA studies. And all of this information is very relevant and very important for conservation. We're limited in what we can do in conservation by knowledge. 
and some of the knowledge, the only way to get it is by catching the bats. So yes, it causes disturbance to individual <coughs> bats, they would rather not be caught, it is invasive, but I think the contribution it makes to conservation far outweighs this if it's done properly and thoughtfully. So the question was, could we catch bats uh, more easily in woodlands using Sussex Autobat? And before I go into that, I should talk a little bit about what the Sussex Autobat is. I know some people here have used them and know them very well, but some haven't. So a little bit of background information. Basically, it's a programmable ultrasound synthesizer, which we use to simulate, simulate bat vocalizations. I have got a few examples of echolocation calls, but the majority of them that we simulate are social calls. It's highly effective as an acoustic lure. It really works very well if it's used properly. And it's not a playback device. It doesn't matter how many times I tell people it's a synthesizer, it's simulating calls, they still seem to think I can feed a recording into it somehow and make it play it back. It's not a playback device. It was based on an original idea of Frank Greenaway's, and uh, he built a hardwired model that made a single sweep over and repeated it over and over again and found that that did attract bats. From there, took the idea to a colleague of mine at the University of Sussex, Peter Reed, an electrical technician, who developed, built and developed the Autobat with uh, input and uh, questions and requests from me and from Frank. Um, which social calls do we use? Well, I'm sure many of you are aware, aware of this paper by uh, Parkinson Push, Push, who found that the six, 16 European species of bats had calls that could be classified into four different types. I'm not a great fan of this categorization for reasons I'll explain, but it's at least useful to think of what we're using in terms of it. They describe four types of calls based on the, the sort of gross structure, A which was a small, B which is a, a repeat repetition of a, a call or a trill, C which are curved calls or cheeps, and D which are complex um, calls or songs. And they also related these to behavioural contexts in which these calls were most frequently um, recorded. Squawks are agonistic interactions, repeated or trill calls when distress or irritated bats. Curve calls, isolation, tandem flights and contact signals. And complex songs most frequently in mate attraction and agonistic interactions. Now one of the problems with this categorisation to my mind is that C actually includes a huge variety of calls used in a huge variety of contexts beyond those that are listed here. It is really, um, you know, to, to, to put them all in this one category is really simplifying things. But most of the calls we use in the Sussex Autobat or we model uh, as, as stimuli on are type C calls recorded from free flying bats. A few of them are complex songs. We have made uh, pipstrum calls, notably uh, Deuce's pipstrum that Dan was going to be talking about uh, later on. We uh, Frank synthesized one of those, which has been very effective. But most of our stimuli are uh, type C. We don't use distress calls, even though there are publications saying that we do. And we've never used them, and we've never used antagonistic interaction calls. Okay, so the initial focus of our work was Bexty's bat. Frank found a colony in uh, Ebono Natural Nature Reserve of Bexty's bats, but they were quite difficult to catch. So we wondered if there was any way that we could improve our capture rate for Bexty's. We got social calls by recording all night outside a tree roost that we found by radio tagging a female uh, to a crack willow. We'll crack a hole in the crack willow. <coughs> and this is just over a second of the, the recording. I'm not going to play it, but you can see in its echolocation calls there are females flying around the roost and various social calls. And we chose this kind of social call, which is very striking, very stereotypic. Um, and we modeled, used these to model um, for the automat. And you can hear what the calls sound like. This is the bat. Simple sinusoidal sweep. Very distinctive, um, we chose those ones. And this is, um, this is the Autobat version of that. There's five very loud calls, because I'm quite close to Autobat. And you can see before it very faintly some echolocation calls. And after the fourth of those big sweeps, you can see a social call. And that's a Bechstein's bat replying. I'll just play that for you. So the echolocation calls are a Bexlein's bat, and that social call is a Bexlein's bat replying, 
affects clients, adult, female. I know that because immediately after this I caught her in a mist net. Okay? Right, so it seems to work. And uh, when we caught females, we could radio tag them and we could find roosts. And this was very helpful. They roost in woodpecker holes like this one, and they are very similar to any other woodpecker hole, and you couldn't identify them really without uh, radio tracking into the individual female back to them. Data on vexed eyes was very poor before 1996, and there were no known breeding colonies in the country. Between 1996 and 2002, five colonies were found using what we could call standard methods. Then, just two years of using the autobat in our spare time, we found eight more colonies. So this was very exciting. We had a way that we could find an exercise bat and a way that we could systematically survey for it. So basically within uh, each 10 by 10 kilometer square, we chose what was the most promising looking wood for the exercise, went in there and followed the protocol with the auto bat and heart traps. And this is what we produced. This is East and West Sussex and uh, the red, Dots show squares where we call female Bechsteins, blue and male Bechsteins, black we call no Bechsteins, open circles, there was no suitable wood, and red question mark, there were suitable woods that we couldn't get permission. But the point is, from this, doing just one wood in each square, we can get an idea of a pattern. There's a hot spot of females there, the males are sort of surrounding it, not many breeding colonies in East Sussex. As many of you know, and many of you were actually involved in it, BCT took this, this uh, methodology on board. Frank and I trained uh, members of local <coughs> groups in our methods, and they were able to produce a regional, open with a lot of effort, a lot of time, uh, and hard work, able to produce a geographic map of Bexline's uh, distribution based on this methodology. So an extremely useful method um, for this kind of work. Okay, but it doesn't only attract Bexline, it's also <coughs> attracting various other species. And this kind of habitat, woodland habitats, have been our focus for most of the time that we've been working with the autobat. Not only uh, English bluebell woods like this one, but also tropical rainforests, warm temperate forests, uh, a variety of different forest types have been the main focus of our work. But um, also trying some more open habitats. This is a region called the Bowra in southern uh, Queensland. I haven't been there myself, but an Australian colleague using some of my equipment went and surveyed in this very open habitat. And last week, this is where I was, <laughs> I got back on Sunday night, so I'm seeing a little bit out of it, but uh, this is why. It's the Pilliga Forest in New South Wales, Australia, um, where we were uh, doing a survey again, using water bats to facilitate patches. More of a forest than the last photograph, but much more open than most of our woodlands. So did it work? I'm going to show you just the results of this one survey rather than go through lots of different surveys as an example of how well the automat worked. Basically, we had three pairs of um, traps each night. One of the traps in the pair had an automat, one was a control trap. We did 42 trap nights in total. So basically, you'd have an automat and a control trap for one night, then the next night you swap them over so it's not a, a position of the trap, um, an effective position of the trap. In total, on 42 trap nights, we caught 112 bats, and this shows how they were caught in the two, two trap types. Auto bats caught an average of 4.5 bats per trap night, control traps 1.3, so it's over three times as many using auto bat. But more interesting in a way is the number of species we generally caught. The average number of species per trap night was 1.4 with auto bat, 0.3 without it, so more than four times the number of species being caught. And then the total species we caught over the whole survey, we caught nine different species in the autobat traps, only four of them in the control traps. So it's giving you an indication of what you can do, and this is an area where we didn't have social calls for local bats, we were using uh, calls of other bats, which luckily have cross-species effect. <coughs> this is one of the uh, species we caught in the autobat traps and not the control. It's an inland pre-tailed bat. We caught two species of pre-tailed bat. These are open sky bats that you can only, usually only catch over water. And great excitement to me, we also caught a sheath-tailed bat, a yellow-bellied yellow sheath-tailed bat, beautiful animal. And uh, my colleague, Brad Law, who works with bats all the time, surveying bats, surveying bats is his job, um, hasn't, hadn't caught one of these for six or seven years. So, you know, it's, it is very effective for open space bats and has huge potential as well as uh, butter bats. 
Okay, if you combine the results of what we've been doing over the past 15 years or so, at least 86 species have been called um, with the autograph. That's in uh, quotation marks because not all of this has been systematically tested. Obviously, we wouldn't possibly have the time to do that. 33 of those species, we've caught 10 individuals or more. Um, in some cases, we've caught hundreds of individuals, for example, of Beckstein's brown long ears and tube nose bats in Japan. 21 species, we caught 4 to 10 individuals in surveys like this Pilliga one I was telling you about, so if anyone actually been to the place once. And 32 species, we only caught one, or one between one and three individuals. So maybe it was by chance, except we don't have anything like that in control traps. We don't have cases where you've caught a species in a control trap and not an auto back trap. So even though the numbers are very small, I believe that the vast majority of these really are responding to the auto back. So 86 different species <laughs> caught so far. If you look at a breakdown of where we caught those different species, we caught 16 of the 17 UK bats. The one we haven't caught is the lesser horseshoe. We caught very few individuals of grey long ears or, or greater horseshoes, but all of the other species, I can say with confidence, we are catching them with the auto bat. Um, 17 of Japanese uh, microbats, that's about half the total diversity of the country. Um, 28 species in Australia. Um, you know, uh, 16 in Malaysia. It's worked in a great variety of places with a great variety of bat species. Um, you don't need to know the details of this table. I'll draw your attention to the important points. These 86 species caught belong to 24 different genera, just to give you an idea of the variety of species we're catching, and seven families, but the vast majority of them were Vespertilionids. This isn't very surprising because, first of all, Vespertilionids are the biggest family of bats um, in the, the old world, and secondly, um, all the calls we're using are based on Vespertilionid calls, so it's not surprising. So some, some stimuli are affected for a lot of bats who've got this cross-species effect, which raises the question why they respond to the autobat. So it could be simply some kind of curiosity about old ultrasound in the environment, or it could be that they're responding specifically to what they perceive as social calls. We've done just one experiment to look into this, and it was related to Steph's uh, thesis work. Basically, um, worked, working on brown long-eared bats, we had 16 sites and six woodlands, um, each night we used two harp traps and uh, we played three different stimuli on the harp traps uh, for, for 20 minutes each or, or something like that. Um, but the order of presentation of the stimuli was ch changed each night. So we played one stimulus with intervals of silence for 30 minutes and then we moved on to the next. These are the stimuli and first of all we had the brain along here call, down like that. A Beckstein's call with, which, with similar frequencies but different time duration. Like that. And then a noise which moves to the similar frequency, similar duration, which sounds like that. And when we compared, what we looked at was um, the number of nights one or more brown long ear bats were caught using each of these stimulus, at stimulus times. What we found is here, uh, brown long ear bats were caught on 10 of the 16 nights that the experiment was run for. If you look at those 10 nights, on 8 of them, we caught them to to the call that's based on brown long ears, two of two we didn't. On two nights we caught them on, uh, in, in relation to the, the Bechstein's call, and on one night in relation to the noise. What this says is they do respond to odd noises in the environment, but they respond much more to a, a simulation of their own species social calls. So even though I can go all over the place and catch bats, if I knew the, the right calls, I could be catching even more bats in those locations. And it is important to get the right social call. And that is a statistically significant difference for anybody who's interested. Okay, now I want to move on to uh, research I've done on uh, one particular species with little tube nose bat in Japan. This is a picture of it. It has Y-shaped nostrils, it's quite a called tube nose bat. It's found in Japan, Korea, and Eastern Russia. Um, very little was known about its ecology or behavior before our work. It was formally classified as vulnerable by the environment agency in Japan. And the autobat increases this capture of this bat by about <coughs> more than 10 times. So you could spend 10 nights and catch one bat, or you could catch an average of one bat every night. Um, this allowed us to study aspects of its ecology, which otherwise would have been impossible using uh, radio tracking. So for example, we found they use a variety of roosts, 
um, including bath flaps and holes, but um, they most often use these bunches of hanging leaves. They get up between the leaves. They change roofs pretty much every day, and so quite difficult to keep up with. Even when they have sucking infants, the females change roofs every day. And maternity colonies show fission fusion behavior. So you might count out seven bats, follow your radio track bat, the next morning you count out the three bats. The next morning you count out and there are five bats. The next morning she's eleven. So very difficult to get a handle on how big the group is because they show this pattern of fission fusion. Um, DNA analysis will reveal that females within a site are kin, so they, they are actually living with their sisters, mothers, aunts, etc. Um, they produce very loud social calls, but we know very little about them, so we used automated ultrasound recorders to examine temporal patterning and seasonal variation in the calls. Um, this is just an example of their co-location and their uh, social calls. So, Very quiet echolocation, impossible to pick up on a detector unless the detector is triggered by the social call most of the time. <coughs> okay, and this is um, based on 18 nights later in the summer. This is the temporal patterning of their calling. There are two peaks, one just after dusk and one just before dawn. <coughs> this is around the time they're leaving their roost and the time that they're going into the new roost. And my conclusion from this is that the calls are somehow related to this pattern of deciding who you're going to be with tonight. You know, they're forming subgroups, they're moving, they're joining, they're coming. there must be some decision-making process. It's not random. You know, they're getting together in a particular cluster of leaves, but not getting together in exactly the same group as they were last night. So I believe that the calls are related to this uh, roost shifting. Also, uh, studied them in the autumn, and there's just a single peak in the autumn, and that comes um, after dusk. In the autumn, they more frequently roost alone, um, individually. I think they do know where each other are, but they're not actually roosting together, so perhaps you don't need to chat about where you're going to go. Please notice that the maximum calls per hour is about 1 in the summer, and the maximum calls per hour is 0.5 in the autumn. Now, I said some calls are effective for a wide range of species, but species-owned calls are usually the most effective. So how can we get new species-specific calls? Well, one way is remote recording in the habitat, like I just showed you did in the tube nose back. We've got loads of recordings out of their social calls, which is great. Another is to record vocal responses to the autobat. And um, we did this again with the little tube nose bat. So we would play periodically through the night an autobat with a remote timer, and we had uh, six play periods, and between play periods there were silences. So this is basically showing, uh, from again from dusk till dawn, and equally spaced through the night, we had these play periods of 20 minutes, during which it would play, silence, play, silence, play, silence. What you can see in the summer is it's hugely increased the, the rate of calling, before the maximum was one, now it's two, and those peaks correspond with the time when the autobats playing. So they are responding vocally to the autobat. Even in between the, um, the, the silence periods, the sort of background level of calling is much higher. And in the autumn, once again, you haven't got one peak this time, you've got a peak corresponding to each of the play periods. So they do respond vocally, and that, that's another way that you can elicit calls and get stimuli for the autobat. It doesn't just apply to clutter bats. I've never seen this bat in my life. Here upon Johansis, the northern freetail bat, but I know I was very close to it because I recorded it at Cape York, right up in the north uh, tropical rainforest of Australia, and uh, recorded this sequence, recorded lots of sequences, but this is it responding to the autobat, <coughs> first of all, um, echolocation calls, and then a lovely sequence of social calls. Now, on all my nights of walking around with the autobat, and with the, sorry, with bat detection, no autobat, I did not hear any calls like this. This was elicited by the autobat. Now I've got that, I can model it, I can play it, and I can see how the bats respond to it and decide whether that's a useful call for survey and maybe be able to do some research into its um, function. Another way of getting species calls is a simultaneous release of multiple individuals. Done this specifically with the genus Nyctopolis, which is the Australasian long-eared bat. There are 12 species of Nyctopolis. 
Nine of them occur in Australia. They all have biotech location, <coughs> and they have social calls. Very unusual for a vespertilionid. It has this, this little nose leaf at the front, but it is a vespertilionid. This is uh, Gouldy's long-eared bat. Um, and the next slide is a simultaneous release of three Nyctophilus bifax, the uh, eastern long-eared bat. Um, all we did was let them out of the bag at the same time, and then I recorded with the bat detector. Now, of course, I don't know which of the bats called. Was it the male or was it one of the two females? I have no idea. But I have two, they're two quite distinctive series of social calls that I can model with the ultrabat, play back, and see how the bats respond. Okay, so that was a very quick overview of some of the stuff that we've done with the ultrabat. I want to just mention a few potential areas, very promising areas, I think, for future work. Uh, looking at variation in response to different kinds of calls, each bat species gives lots of different kinds of seed calls. It's just that most of the time we don't hear them because they give them when they're flying around in the forest. You have to stand in the forest with a bat detector or record all night in the forest in order to get them. Um, also, it would be interesting to look at the comparative effectiveness of synthesized call versus direct playback. I do own a bat lure, I do own an AT100. I've used them both, but not very much because they haven't worked out anything like as well for me as the autobat. Daniel Harvey's had a slightly different experience, which I'll tell you about this afternoon. But they do have a differential effectiveness, and it would be interesting to know why synthesized calls seem to work so well. Um, the seasonal variation in responsiveness, we don't have very good data on this, but it's quite clear from the work that we do. There are also sex differences in responsiveness, and the sex differences change seasonally. And it would be great to get some systematic data on this and try and work out why it is that the same calls produce different responses in the two sexes at different times of year. And finally, of course, there's the potential negative impact of broadcasting ultrasound in the environment. Steph's going to mention some of her research, which, which certainly is <coughs> suggestive about this, and I think it's a really important area for research to be conducted in. But the problem is that all of, the, all of these questions can only be answered by systematic studies. And I'm now working in consultancy too. It's very difficult to find time to do a systematic study when your main driver is to catch those bats and find out what's there. But it really does need um, work to, to sort these things out. We can optimize the, the autobat for the future. Um, a lot of people have contributed work, and I haven't been able to mention it because of the time. Um, but these are are those people who've contributed over the years, um, and, or some of them, sorry, I can see the there, and uh, the work has been funded at various times by the Japanese government and by the People's Trust for Endangered Species. Thank you very much.